Out of Judaism had come quite a few people, hundreds and thousands, who had realized the law could not save them. The Ten Commandments could not be kept to satisfy the law of God. For you see, the law of God is much greater than the Ten Commandments. Jesus illustrated that with the rich young ruler who came to him and said, Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And the Lord said, Have you kept the commandments? He said, Every one of them. Since my youth, I'm good at good, good shoes. That's me. I've done everything right. Nothing wrong. So therefore, I should get in the kingdom of God. Jesus said, you've kept the law? He said, yep. Well, then sell what you have, give to the poor, take up your cross, and follow me. I personally think that cross is our self. You know, this, this old man causes me a lot more trouble than anybody else. The thoughts and intents of my mind are always on trial. And I have to learn to listen to that still small voice to do the will of God, not the will of me. To profit the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of David. It's the battle. But many of these Hebrews who had come from Judaism into Christianity had come from law to grace were having a hard time. Now, I have not been in prison, but I visit people who have been, and they, they tell me there are people who cannot live outside of prison. They're so conditioned to that lifestyle that when they let them loose on parole, they do whatever they can to get back inside where they're used to it, where it's comfortable. Maybe watch some of these people on TV. And they've interviewed them and said, we don't know what to do on the outside. We're going to spend the rest of our life in prison. Well, these Jews had been released from the prison of rules and regulations and given into an area of following the Holy Spirit every moment of every day to living the life of Christ rather than following the law. And in this, they each one have what I have. They had a cross to bear, which was their person, which is a combination of all the involvement we've had in our, all the relationships we've had in our life, be they religious, social, economical, whatever, they all impact our life. And now they're being asked to leave all that behind and follow Christ and do what he would do and ask the question in every situation, Father, what would you have me to do? Christ didn't have television to watch. We do. Christ didn't have the internet to watch. We do. So it's not what Jesus would do. It's, Lord, what would you have me to do with my environment? How can I show the life and love of Jesus in the world I live in? And there were a lot of Christians that were going back to the practice of Judaism, of the law, and the traditions of the Jewish church, or religion, because it was comfortable. It was easy to live in the prison of that religion rather than having to walk with the Lord day by day. They could take a little a particular passage and stamp it on whatever situation it was, even though it offended and broke other people's hearts and restored their life, destroyed their life, because they weren't ready for whatever it was that was put on. 
So one by one, they were going back to Judaism because it was comfortable. It was comfortable being in a prison of that religion. So he writes to them. The first chapter, he said, listen. He made some notes. You have the notes in your bulletin. First thing he told them, He said that we have a redeemer who came to set us free from the bondage of sin and death. John 1 through verse 12, he says that he created all things and he wants to be your redeemer. And he showed us the way because he was full of grace and truth. He came full of grace and truth. Not law and judgment, but grace and truth. That's the first chapter. We're moving right along, aren't we? Second chapter. In John chapter 6, Jesus said, Unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have, we don't have a relationship. And everybody thought, well, man, this guy, this guy wants us to eat each other up. He wants us to be cannibals. No. He starts that discourse by saying in verse 35, eating is believing, drinking is coming. I'm sorry, eating is coming, and drinking is believing. Unless we come to the crucified Christ and participate in the agony that he went through for us, and rejoice in the finished work of Christ, we cannot grow. Unless we drink of his blood, that is, believe upon him, that in the toughest trial and temptation that we have, we will choose to follow him rather than follow our traditions of the past that we've been taught. Moving along, chapter 3. How's this? Chapter 3. In John chapter 3, it tells us how we can have rest. Nicodemus came and said, Good master, I know that you have come from heaven. I know that you are the redeemer because of the miracles you do are coinciding with the miracles predicted by Isaiah and you have fulfilled every one of them. You are the Redeemer. Jesus, reading his heart, answered the question of his heart. And he said, Nicodemus, you must be born from above. He used the expression, must be born again. Other translations say. Nicodemus says, how can I go the second time in my mother's womb? My mother's almost 101. I I don't think that would work. I think she'd slap me. I I know she would slap me. He was being facetious because he had no answer. No, no, didn't know how to ask the question. Have you ever had a situation where you didn't know what to say and you made a joke out of it so that you could avoid the conversation? Well, that's what Nicodemus did. Jesus would not let go of him because Nicodemus knew who Jesus was. He said, marvel not that I say you must be born again. You must be born of the flesh and then born anew into the spirit. Not just one. Not one birth, but two births. That was his explanation. And of course... Nicodemus, being pretty smart, he was one of the most intelligent men around, very rich, member of the Sanhedrin. And uh, he said, but how do I know that I've been born from above? Jesus said, see those trees? See how they're moving? What causes them to move? What causes them to move is the wind. Do you know where the wind comes from or where it goes? You don't. But you do know when it, when it blows on you. And you do know when the Holy Spirit gives you direction. 
in every situation of your life. We know what's right. We read the book. You're not sure what? Read the book. You know, follow the life of Jesus and the choices he made. Choices against going against tradition and towards bringing peace and goodwill among men. But by his spirit, he begins to change us. Now our hearts are pure. We've arrived. Some religions will tell you, you will sin no more. They call it sanctification, an act of sanctification. Then after that, you'll never sin. Well, I guess I missed out on that lesson because things started coming back in my life. Paul is talking to those Hebrews. He told them, you know, you can't let the old traditions come back into your life and destroy your life. You can't allow the rules and regulations to overcome grace and peace, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, maintenance, kindness, the fruit of the Spirit. So what we're going to have to do is clean you out again. Boom. Just like that. Hand of God reaches down, and we're clean. Whew. I'll never sin again. Uh-oh. Now I can't really see the sun. I can't see any above me because now envy and stress and, and, and ill will towards each other comes into our, our hearts and our mind. That's when we need another douse of the Holy Spirit who he said would lead us into all truth and cleanse us from everything that's not right. Ooh, John 1, 9. Hmm, well, I got it all figured out now. If I go to church every Sunday, then that will be my cover. I'll sing in a choir. I'll be a preacher. Man, I'm perfect. I've got it made. Whoop, here comes the Holy Spirit. Dave, no, you need to be cleansed from all unrighteousness. And... Now, we have earthly goods that blind our view of the kingdom of God. Well, we're going to get a bunch in there. Man, that's, I'll tell you, that's bad. We are worried about our, our social structure in our community, our family and our friends. They do exciting things. We don't do it, but we like to be around them. People, places, and things. The people you run with is who you really are, and you need to be cleansed again by the Holy Spirit. And drive all that stuff out of you and become pure in the life of Christ. Let's overflow that baby a little bit. Okay. There is victory. There is victory in Jesus. Not in anything, any any system, any opportunity that looks wonderful, but it's going to hurt somebody else, we are ambassadors for Christ. Amen. We are ambassadors for Christ. We represent the kingdom of God. And because we do, we need to act like it. Hallelujah. And if you don't know what the rules are, read it. Read it. For his word is like a sharpened two-edged sword setting asunder the soulish man the selfish man, the man that we were to the person we can become in Christ. Amen. That sharpened two-edged sword is the word of God, and it's not just the Bible. He speaks through many ways. But they better lined up with the Bible. You know, you'll have friends that will give you advice. It sounds good. Check it out. You sound a preacher that looks good, smells good. He's going to be hairless. Don't believe him. Do not believe this guy. Check it out with a book. 
check it out with the Bible. For he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by him. I challenge you to be a living example of the life of Christ in your community. God bless you.